Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Julie and I are going to try to recreate uh, how I built this with Guy Raz, which makes me Guy Raz. If you're not already watching or listening <laughs> to that podcast, it's my favorite one by far. Um, and I'm pretty much <laughs> caught up on every single episode, so I'm constantly like refreshing the screen trying to get the next one. Um, but the idea of that podcast is really to kind of start back in an entrepreneur's history and sort of learn what motivates them, and frankly, also hear about sort of the trials and tribulations. What you get to see about Julia in the press is all the big highlights and the big moments, but you, we all know that while people think success looks like this in a startup, it's actually really more like a bunch of squiggly lines <laughs> or a sine wave. Um, so we wanted to get a little bit more of like the real life of an entrepreneur in this experience. So yes. thank you, Julia, for being kind enough to join me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Um, so Julia and I actually have known each other for a pretty long time, given that she's only been in Austin since sometime in 2016. Three years. Yeah, yeah. so I met her in 2015, so I jumped the gun. Uh, my business partner, Sarah and I, as uh, the moderator mentioned, uh, have a, a venture fund focused specifically on women-led companies in markets where women are making the buying decisions, and of course, healthcare is one of those. And so I got really lucky and got to meet Julia uh, when she was just first, really, honestly, I don't even know if you were thinking about moving to Austin at that point. You were just working on a health tech yep. startup. So um, that's where we started. So I have kind of some good history um, to kind of dig into, but I thought it'd be great to get a sense of like literally who you are. So sure. where'd you grow up? I think you're a native Texan. Yes. Um, and you know, what, when you were little, what was your childhood like? And were you one of those people that was, you know, selling candy to your classmates for a markup at school and always entrepreneurial, or did that develop later for you? Yeah, so first of all, I'm super happy to be here. It's just really fun for me to be on stage with Carrie, um, having had their support for a number of years, um, back when no, I had no revenue and was new to the space, um, and they've always had my back. So this is really exciting, um, and just excited to share a little bit about the story. So I did grow up in Dallas. I'm a native Texan. Um, I was actually quite a rule follower of a kid, and really the opposite of what you often hear from like, oh, I started my first business at three, you know, or all those stories <laughs> about founders. No, like, that was just, no, no, that wasn't me. Um, but I was really focused, I think, on always making my own decisions. And I always kind of, I, I chose things that were not on the common path. So I was a competitive equestrian for 25 years, which was very um, outside of the social structure of my high school and of kind of where I lived growing up in Dallas. And then I also was deeply focused on academics. So I oftentimes toiled for years and years and years in a sport that took 15 years for me to ever see any rewards. Um, I worked really hard at my school. Um, and that was really what was the foundation of my childhood and early professional career. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I'm someone who really loves the process of work um, and loves digging in and loves creating. And that was also why when I started in consulting after my undergrad degree, that wasn't a great fit for me because um, I couldn't really dig in and roll up my sleeves and create solutions to problems. And so by the time I actually was at business school, it became very clear to me that really the path was building a company. It just took me a while after that um, to figure out what idea I wanted to build so, on. So when you were at business school, you were already thinking about entrepreneurial, you wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but you had to like find the idea, right. so to speak. Exactly. Well, I was really really fortunate in that I entered business school in this perfect storm right at the recession, September of 2009, where a lot of people around me in the environment were female founders founding really successful companies. So um, a close friend of mine is Cat Lake at Stitch Fix. I was around the Birchbox founders, the Rent the Runway founders, um, the Guilt Group founders, not to mention companies like Oscar Health, Coupang, Grab Taxi, all of which came out of my particular class that I think was often driven by this so you have need. a high bar. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, not that, but also uh, this particular need coming out of a recession, it changes, or in a recession, it really changes the dynamics of how people start to think about creating their own future. And I think it was a big driver in the shift that you've seen in the traditional business school environment towards startups and entrepreneurship. And so I was kind of on the, the leading edge of that, and I got to observe a lot of that. Um, and so while I didn't do it right away after business school, I thought, well, if they can all do it, I can do it too. Well, it's funny, because so I went to business school um, at Harvard too in 99, and of course when I was there, yeah. was also doing all these entrepreneurial things. And so it had been traditionally for I don't know how many years, you leave HBS and you choose 
consulting or investment banking, yep. right? But when I was there in 99, everyone was doing business plans, et cetera, and I actually wrote a business plan that was in the business plan competition um, and then went straight to McKinsey. Yeah. Um, and so I, four months later, I was like, oh, this is not for me, <laughs> um, and left and went to a startup, and that sort of, I got myself back into the startup world, but sure. you left HBS and went to Deloitte, right? Well, after H, that was before. Oh, that was um, before. But okay. after, I actually went to the Bush Center in Dallas. I went nonprofit. So right. I had this whole bend of wanting to be like a nonprofit entrepreneur, and I had a great experience actually building something from scratch, which was a really good early startup-like experience, um, but ultimately decided I wanted to be back in the private sector. And actually thought I'd find my idea in financial services and payments. So I went and led global strategy for the CFO of MoneyGram um, and realized in 2013 I had way missed the boat on payments. There were like 10,000 <laughs> payments apps. I was like, okay, not, <laughs> not in this industry. Um, and ultimately was really, really happy in the corporate job that I had, but felt like when I had this idea for Everlywell, which I know we'll get to, like the overwhelming emotion that if I did not do this, I would regret it the rest of my life. And that was really the driver for me in making the choice. It wasn't that I had this idea that I really thought would be successful. It wasn't that I had this conviction. I mean, it was truly this just overwhelming emotion that I had no other choice to make um, that drove me to make the decision on that particular business idea. I had had a lot of different ideas. I had worked on different concepts, and this was the one that I just felt I could dedicate what I, I mean, for me, startups are not overnight, right? This is potentially a decade um, or longer, and I felt like I could really be passionate about this and go through what it was gonna take for a decade. Well, I think it's really important to think about sort of what motivates entrepreneurs or, how, or just sort of differentiate. You know, there are people who literally are just, I'm gonna do a startup, they create like a search fund okay. kind of list of Excel spreadsheet of ideas, and they, what they really want is to be an entrepreneur versus I see a problem and I really wanna solve that problem. And there are different approaches, there are probably different motivations for or, you know, what the, re you know, am I looking for an exit or am yeah. I looking to solve this problem, et cetera. And so you had a personal experience, actually, right, that yes. drove you to see that there was a pain. Um, first pain was actually for you personally. Right. And then, you know, sort of were able to see that you weren't the only consumer with this pain. So you want to tell a little bit about your personal health journey? Yeah. And, and I think this happens a lot um, with women founded companies. <clears throat> it does. We is, see it all the time, actually. Is often um, women have a problem that's not addressed in the market that's being totally ignored. And and they say, you know what, I'm going to fix it. Um, and that was a little bit of what happened with me. So I um, obviously had no healthcare background prior to starting Everly Well, but I had all of the experience in healthcare of being a consumer of healthcare, like all of you are. And so I went through this kind of six month process of unexplainable symptoms that ended up being frankly, fairly minor, a bunch of hormone and vitamin imbalances, um, but took me six different doctors to eventually get to that conclusion. And through that process of six different doctors, they all ran a whole bunch of different lab tests of which I got the results for one, um, and cost on like me a printout with like the dot matrix, to me. Yeah, yeah, printer with the, the holes on the side. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, no phone calls, no kind of information about what these tests were, and I was on a high deductible plan um, through my corporate, my good corporate job. I was 29 years old. I was like, I'm healthy. I'm sure I have good insurance, and it still ended up costing me over two thousand dollars out of pocket. Um, and so I went through this process of not only did I not get value out of the service, not only where the, did the physicians not get value, but then I ended up adding, they added insult to injury by billing me over this course of months and months. And um, I've largely avoided, frankly, doctors for the last three years where I could, and I was reminded, because um, I'm having to go to the doctor more often now, um, I'm expecting. Um, we're, and allowed so, to, we're allowed to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, so, um, but I was reminded I got a bill two weeks ago for a lab test that said, your physician may not have told you that we would be billing you separately for this and that the price would not be disclosed. Right, and so the problem just continues to be reinforced, and so we set out not to, you know, we focus on a, I focus on a very specific part that I wanted to solve, which was lab testing is important for people. It's seventy percent of diagnoses. There's seven billion tests run a year. Consumers don't, patients and consumers don't know what they're getting. They don't know what it's going to cost, and they don't know if it's helpful for them or not. And so that seemed to me like a big market, but with a very specific purpose that we could tackle. But what's so. interesting about what you're doing about it, um, in terms of when you start thinking about, so Sarah and I spend a lot of time looking at healthcare startups, and a big question is always reimbursement. How are, is the, you know, this, how is it going to be paid for, and i.e., is it like Medicare, insurance, et cetera, who's going to pay for it? Yeah. And you're doing all self-pay, so the consumers yep. actually pay out of pocket for these tests. We do. Um, so talk about 
sort of how you've been able to grow it that big when you probably got a lot of skepticism right. that consumers weren't going to pay out of pocket for tests. Yeah, no, everyone told me that no one would pay for this. So, um, and actually, <laughs> that's tweeted, usually a good sign that you're on. <laughs> yeah, by I the way, tweeted, when everyone tells you you're wrong. Yeah. I tweeted yesterday because the upshot in the New York Times yesterday morning was about the price of blood testing in America and how it varies for the same test from eleven dollars to fifteen thousand dollars depending on your zip code, and also that you cannot find out in fact, what your blood test will cost ahead of time. And I tweeted about it because this was the business, entire business case of why I thought Everly Well would work was not because suddenly people cared about paying for their health care, but because the market demanded, unfortunately, in this country that consumers were going to have to be starting to pay for more and more of their care, which has happened, and that the systems and incentives are not set up to actually share with consumers what the price of those services cost. Um, and so... Uh, but when I was initially starting the company and raising money, no one, not a single venture capitalist anywhere in the world would believe that this was going to be the case and that a consumer would pay for these services. And we've obviously seen that cost dynamic shift really drastically even since 2015. But I, I saw it because I went through it. I knew 40% of Americans were on high deductible plans and I knew that tons of people were on HSAs and FSAs. So I had the data and the experience as the user to know that. Now, what I didn't know at the time was how big it would be and how big of a problem it would be. I knew for women 25 to 45 that were falling through the parachute, so if they had vitamin D, if they had fertility issues, if they had um, endocrinology, thyroid issues, none of that stuff was being covered for them. So that was a big enough market where I said, I know we can get those people, um, but it's even much broader now than I thought. Well, and, and your factor was really a lot about, the first one you're mentioning um, is about the um, high deductible plans and right. sort of having to take more of this on. The other factor, of course, has been the consumerization of healthcare and sort of patients exactly. taking it into their own hands and realizing, you know, A, that you need to look at yourself holistically and not just, oh, the urologist thinks it's a urology problem and, right. you know, the endocrinologist thinks it's a hormone problem and it turns out it's a system problem, right? But that there are now consumers just being much more proactive about, I want to understand what's going on so yeah. that I can navigate this, which is another factor, obviously. Absolutely. And I think it, it's really divided by, like, if you have received an unknown medical bill, you never want to go through that again. And that user and that consumer is super passionate about never being in that situation again. Um, I think it was $88 billion of medical debt last year for Americans. And just this process is so negative that it causes people to dig, I can literally path. think of things in my Facebook feed and my Twitter yeah. feed right now of people being so frustrated with the yeah. system, right? And can taking it control in your hand. Maybe it's $75, but it's like $75 and no calls to healthcare co or insurance company who will right. name remain unnamed, you know, <laughs> 17 calls. Um, so uh, this is the fund conference and yes. you started alluding to fundraising. So your first fundraise, you had this crazy idea that you would actually consumerize lab testing, which is, you know, those of you who know, mostly dominated um, from the consumer's point of view by two huge behemoths, mm -hmm. Quest and LabCorp. And there's a lot of specialty labs that are out there, but you don't, as a consumer, generally interact with them and you always had to physically go into them. Right. Um, you wanted to make this, you know, direct to consumer, consumers pay out of pocket, et cetera. How many VCs just lined up with excitement? All of them, they were so excited. They're they're like, this, is, this is a billion dollar idea. No, so, um, I, and just to like give some context for those of you that don't know, what Everly Well is, we are a technology platform um, and a brand that connects consumers to over 40 different physician-ordered lab tests, all of which are done at home. So we work with partner labs, we work with partner physician networks, and we really provide the brand and consumer experience as well as the actual content and information that you need to manage your health. And so... Um, and these are all lab tests that already exist. Exactly. They're certified labs. So it's not some... No it's the novelty isn't in the lab tests. Correct. It's the getting them to you in a consumer-friendly way, interpreting them, right. you know, being able to converse with a doctor after the fact. And so it's really putting the friendly packaging around existing lab tests in a way that hasn't been done. Consumers haven't been part of the process. Right. And so, so it is, it's a platform to do that. But, you know, a lot of the feedback was, oh, so you're a marketing company. And I was like, well, in the same way Uber's a marketing company for drivers, sure. Um, but there was a lot of feedback around consumers aren't going to pay for it. It's not defensible. Um, you know, you're a marketing company. You're not doing anything new. And so, you know, I understood those those kind of no's, right? I understood the premise, but I, I fundamentally believed that I saw the shift that was going to be happening. Um, and so, you know, it took us me a long while to actually get, we were three and a half million in from angels and we were doing three million a year in sales, just under. 
um, before any institutional VC said yes. Um, and so we were, it was a long kind of eking out road of initial capital to try to get to a point where I could get an institutional investor to invest. And ultimately, when you, when you talk to Next Gen Venture Partners, John Bassett, who's here in town, who was the first person to say yes unequivocally, like, we don't care if anybody else invests, like, we're giving you this money, do I what you want. I remember this conversation yeah. we talked to, I think that same day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he said, he said, the reason I'm doing it is because I still am not sure I get it but I've never seen a founder hit numbers like this in such a short period of time. So even he will tell you, now he gets it, but he was just like, I just <laughs> think here, I need so to give you money. Here, yeah. yeah, he might be, but that, um, <laughs> that was fundamentally what made the difference. It's like, oh, you said you were gonna go do this and you have these crazy revenue numbers and that's something that we wanna be a part of. Well, and what's interesting slash sad slash the state of reality is at least what uh, Sarah and I have found with yeah. women funder or women entrepreneurs is, you know, we all, I'm sure by now know the numbers that less than 2% of venture capital dollars actually go to companies. Right. With a female CEO, despite the fact that they outperform significantly, um, that most of the women that we see um, have had to find a way to get product in market and revenue before they're able to get funding. Um, and they're scrappy enough to do so, whether they're using sort of their own personal assets or bootstrapping and getting right. into revenue. Um, but frankly, the companies we see are risk reduced because of it, but it's sort of um, unfortunate that, it, you know, that they've had to the, go that, to that extreme. Now, I will say I did have a lot of really supportive angels, obviously. So I did have money that had come in from outside parties, but I had to prove a lot more than many other people in the market um, in order to get kind of that first real capital injection that we needed as a healthcare company to, to grow. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, you're actually producing something physical too, it exactly. wasn't just software, you're actually getting a kit in the mail. Right. Um, and it's gotta be a nice customer experience because it's this, you know, it's sort of like getting your Apple, your Mac yeah. box or whatever. Um, and so how did you get those first angels on board? Because of course there's that chicken and egg problem for yes. entrepreneurs of, you know, how do you get that momentum? How do you look appealing where there's this sense of missing out? Right, et cetera. right, which sometimes can backfire. I've also had that happen too. I mean, like, oh, I oversold, you know, the, the deal. But I, the first angel, I actually didn't have a business plan for. I mean, I had the entire vision. I knew what we were going to do, but it's not like I had put together a formal pitch deck. And actually, with each of my rounds, I've made the pitch deck, but never ended up having to use it, which I don't know if it's the process of the pitch deck that gets you to kind of yeah, have the narrative, your, yeah, right? Your story um, but I haven't, you know, I've been all ready to go with my formal things and haven't necessarily had to go that far with it. But he came on board because he was a sophisticated angel investor in the agriculture and health space. And it, it was a little bit for him, I mean, I think he fully believed in the financial return, but he also felt like he would be doing good in a way. He really believed in the mission of the company and what we were trying to do, but he took a huge bet, um, a huge bet, and has been rewarded for that bet. Um, yeah. And then the next angel who came in was a physician entrepreneur. And so he had done a lot of investing in the in diagnostic space and in bringing more consumer-friendly kind of diagnoses. Uh, so diagnostics. he had real so he had real experience. industry experience. Yeah. yeah. So he saw some of the same challenges so, you saw. Exactly. And so he committed. Um, but again, I had a lot of no's, and I never approached it as worrying about a no. I mean, that's very standard in fundraising. For me, it was okay, I need one yes, like that's all I need to keep going is I need one yes. And so I focused on that and I, I really will say early on, I was very fortunate in getting very, very good investors on board because I didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, and I, I needed kind of the only people who would believe in this. And what do you mean by you didn't have choice? I, like it, early on, nobody would give me money, right? Oh, so like, so you, like, so you're like, like, who's gonna give me money? I don't like you, but you're I'm gonna my, take right, money. Right, <laughs> and, I, and I had, but I've been fortunate in that like we've had really great investors and I feel like I got very, very lucky yeah. with that because I, I needed the capital no matter what. It's an interesting, um, um, story you mentioned about the putting together of the pitch deck versus actually using it. Right. Because frankly, a lot of times um, it's about building the relationship with the investor yeah. over time. And we, you know, tend to want to see companies before they're raising and actually see uh -huh. to the point that, you know, that John made with you that you, you would hit your numbers. If you tell me after the fact that you hit your numbers and they look really good, that's really different mm -hmm. than me hearing what you say you're going to do and then having you actually do it and being able to kind of yeah. see the delta over time. And so if you have now form, you know, sort of crafted your yeah. story, but then you're having a conversation and building a relationship and then showing it over time. It's a lot more effective than a, an investor at one point in time just seeing a deck and going, wow, it's 
a pretty deck, you've got a great graphic designer, yeah. like looks good, um, as opposed to you know having that relationship over time, at least in our experience. Oh no, I, I totally agree. I think at any stage, no matter what, I rarely hear that investors will invest in someone that they haven't known for at least a year. Um, and early stage, sometimes they have to move faster than that, but you know, we, again, got that first investor on board because I had pitched to him a year before and he had said no, but he watched and he knew what I had said yeah. a year before. Um, and so a lot, I, I think that's very common. And even now, I mean, I'm never, I try to always be like, well, now I'm not fundraising. Like that has just never worked and as much as I try. <laughs> um, because when you're thinking about your capital strategy, which is really important, it's all about making sure that you're seeding those relationships and those key points about what you're going to be doing. And then you can follow up every six months, in nine months, and 12 months, and say, hey, we did this. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking through our portfolio yeah. in my head, and I can think of at least three or four companies where we said no, or we weren't ready, or they weren't ready, and then a year later, you know, we kept conversations yeah. going, and, you know, half, at least half of our portfolio is exactly that. And it's now. an interesting time right now, because it is a founder's market, and it's an entrepreneur's market in a way, um, and so VCs at every stage have often had to get um, pretty aggressive in terms of preempting deals or those kind of things. And so if you don't already have a relationship with the entrepreneur for the companies that are already performing really well, um, oftentimes the entrepreneur is already well down the path with other, and that's what's happened to us with the pitch decks, right? Is, is I yep. have not gotten as far in the process, which is a, a great problem to have, but it's a different, a different strategy yeah. um, than, the, than the more traditional, like I'm gonna button up and put a process together. So we're definitely gonna wanna talk about your $50 million raise and how that <laughs> looked like and how you got sure. there, but I wanna sort of go sequentially, yeah. so you know, put a pin in that. Great. Um, obviously for those of you, the audience members who have followed along, you, had, um, you went on Shark Take. Yes. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think people think, oh, that's a cool TV show, you got on there, but you had a real strategy around it. It was not just a, oh, I'll apply, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, it really was strategic to your company and what you focus on, and you did a lot of work in preparation for it, right? It yes. wasn't just show up and see if it goes well. So do you want to talk about that experience? Yeah, so I had a great experience on Shark Tank, but this was a, a strategy that started 18 months before we um, aired on the show and probably six months before I was even asked to apply for the show. So for us, um, what continues to be the biggest opportunity for Everly Well is that we're creating a new category. So that requires immense amounts of consumer education and marketing, and we obviously did not have the dollars to do that. And at the time, I had thought about you know, things like the Today Show, like what are the platforms that educate mass market for the everyday American, and that was the Today Show, GMA, news shows, et cetera, and we hadn't been able to kind of break in there. And so I thought Shark Tank is really the opportunity to have seven million people watching to see like how mass market of a brand can this be? How big can this opportunity be? And so um, I, was, I was approached by a producer, but I had already had conversations with my board and with two investors that were encouraging me to apply. And when I did apply, I did a lot of research around the process, around the work. And to be honest with you, it was the majority of my year of 2017, the preparation for it, the diligence after the deal, and then going into the airing and the prep for that. And so it is not to be taken lightly for sure, um, but ultimately for our business, the company had such an incredible um, outcome from it because of the response. So we doubled overnight, but then sustained that growth, which is really rare. Um, for Shark Tank, it's usually like a spike. Um, and so it was definitely worth it, but it was very strategic. We also were, I was legitimately wanting to get a shark on board, um, Mark Cuban or Lori Grenier, because we wanted help with kind of the productization of lab testing. How do you make that something that's exciting, that's a, that's a retail CPG product that's then also tied to a technology experience? I mean, this is a, a new space that we want to be simple for consumers, but is kind of grounded in a lot of complexity that we have to explain. So ultimately, we got Lori Grenier on board, who has been really helpful in thinking through a lot of that. Um, and then, you know, has over the last two years then subsequently helped us drive our brick and mortar strategy, um, which we can talk about in a minute. But there's all these pieces that ended up building on each other. And I think something really interesting that I don't share that much about Shark Tank is we knew that there would hopefully be a good consumer response. But I didn't, you know, business executives are consumers too. And what ended up happening is executives from CBS, from Humana, um, from a number of large organizations saw Shark Tank and then did deals with us as a result of the show. 
And that was definitely not something we predicted mm -hmm. and has been a really, really positive outcome for us as well. Um, but, you know, I was, there was a lot of risk involved. I had to figure out how to make sure that I was communicating this in a way that was um, accretive to the brand and that, you know, they edit a bunch of live footage or a bunch of like unedited footage that they just roll the cameras when you walk in there um, and making sure that, you know, you're doing right by the brand. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so during this course of time, up until this great round that you just raised or this big round, we'll talk about like the implications of it, <laughs> uh, this big scary round, uh, talk about the growth because you're now even just in advance of you, the round closed in February, right. but up to 70 people or I might probably, I might, might yeah. be outdated on that number. Yeah. Um, but huge amount of growth in people, in revenue, um, in the kinds of tests that you're offering, mm -hmm. and then in channel, you first started all e-commerce, and now you have a relationship, I think, with Target. Yeah. Um, you did some partnerships, like with Helix. So, what was that growth like, and where yeah. were the biggest challenges? That, like, if you're going to give some like lessons learned to the audience that they might be able to sure er learn from, like, yeah. what was that like? So, so today, so from we aired on Shark Tank in November of 2017, um, closed an unannounced Series A that we did not disclose. In in January of 2018, and then closed the Series B um, in February of 2019. So uh, just for context, and I think now, to Carrie's point, we're now 75 people. Um, we will likely, potentially, I don't know if I'm totally committed to 50 million, but I think we'll hit 50 million in sales this year, we'll see. Um, and we really have just had this tremendous growth trajectory coupled with um, obviously scaling the company as well. And I think that, that is looking back, I mean, when we were on Shark Tank just, you know, 18 months ago, um, we were at 13 people and had done that year, I think, uh, before Shark Tank, like three and a half million. So it's, it's been a really rapid growth. And I think it's very, very, I mean, scale is so challenging. And no matter how many things you read about it and lessons learned, this is just the very hardest part of growth. And like when I founded the company, I like couldn't envision getting to a million dollars in sales. Like that just wasn't even, I couldn't even think about it, right? <laughs> I had to like think about the next day to like stay alive. Um, and now we're here. And I think one of the most surprising pieces for me is beyond 20 people, how quickly it started to feel and operate like a big company, which I had been a part of for a long time. And some of the pressures of like fighting against some of that. So um, Do you have an employee handbook. No, I, I refuse. <laughs> okay. I refuse the employee handbook. Okay, just, I'm like, I can't. I can't. Did you have to read it? Yeah, it's, oof, it's I know. Yeah, and the lawyers of. really want one. And I'm like, I can't do it. So, um, but so we don't have an employee handbook. But I mean, you know, most of my job since we were probably 25 people is communicating the same thing over and over again in different forums, at different meetings, <laughs> town halls. Consistently. Weekly. Yeah, consistently managing my leadership team, recruiting my C-level team. Most of my job is also spent in recruiting and in developing the best people. Um, and then, of course, driving kind of partnerships and external facing and sales. But I think that those things are really what the job becomes much more quickly as CEO and founder than I actually thought. Because, I, you know, I founded the company to spend a and lot of time in the product. The product, right, the, the, product the marketing, like, like the new ad to the consumer. And I wanted to like try out this marketing message and A-B tested and all those things. And I'm deeply committed to and pretty OCD, frankly, about the product. And I've had to let a lot of that go to really excellent people who I'm sure are much, frankly, much better than me at it on the team. Um, but that was probably the biggest lesson learned for me is how quickly, like really rapidly from 20 people, it started to feel like a totally different job. And you know what, as CEO and founder, you have to adapt to that really fast. And your role changes every six to nine to 12 months. And that means your people also have to adapt under you and, and kind of level up as well. Yeah. Um, and so I've tried to do that, but that's been probably for me a huge lesson and just being open to that and understanding how quickly your role is going to change. Well, and, and having the skill set or sort of yeah. the willingness to do it because yeah. someone uh, on an earlier panel kind of said like, how is Mark Zuckerberg still the CEO of Facebook? <laughs> and it is a rarity to actually it's be true. able to be the guy in the hoodie and the Adidas flip-flops and then taking yeah. it all the way through to what they're doing, whether that we like what they're doing or not. But I mean, not everyone actually sort of sees that has the foresight to see that their role actually should change. Yeah. And a lot of people get really stuck in the product because they, especially when you were the, you were the first target market yourself. Right. And so you knew what you wanted and it can be very hard to let go and actually rise up and lead. So yeah. kudos to you for sort of seeing that your role it's, needed to change. Well, and certainly there hasn't been without some pitfalls. In this <laughs> but, um, but I think that's probably the biggest adjustment that we've had. And so quickly. Yeah.
So. Yeah. And so now 70 plus people all here in Austin. All here in Austin. A lot of the hiring sort of happened in the first quarter of this year, but still looking for some key people. You want to shout out for any roles? Or yeah. Well, for? always looking for engineers and product people, um, director of performance marketing, director of brand. Yeah. We're hiring a, a number of people right now. So. And then from a business point of view, you've started shifting into uh, retail. Yep. So talk a little bit about like what changed. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, we began a retail strategy. This is probably like the longest thing I've committed to in the startup, right? Because everything's sort of like, I want it on a quick cycle and we iterate. And if it doesn't work, we don't do it. And if yep. it does, we keep going. We started a retail strategy with a broker in March of 2016. So we're three years in and just now landed a national rollout at Target. We've been in CVS for about a year. Um, and we're also in Kroger and, and now a number of others with the Target News. And so um, I just ultimately, I mean, I think what's somewhat interesting is we I've always had the same vision. It's the, always the vision I've raised money off of. It's, Actually, it's, I went it's, and looked up the deck that I got from her in December yeah. 2015, and she's right. The branding's even I was going to say, oh, gosh, no, I don't know what it, it looks like. like. I, I, yeah, no, it actually is yeah. the same vision. I just wondered, like, I wonder what she said to me yeah. in December 2015. It's the same vision. Yeah, and so. and so part of that has always been that the goal was to create a mass market brand that was at a price point where you didn't have to wonder if your insurance would be more affordable. And so our goal has always been, at scale to migrate prices downward to create affordable products, and part of that means things uh, products for Americans where they live, work, and shop. Um, and that is not just on our dot-com brand, although that's currently 95% of our business. Um, that's in places like Target and Walgreens and CVS, et cetera. And so it was a long haul. I mean, it is not a short process to get into retail, but what was funny about it is we had been, we actually had last year, at the end of last year when I presented my plan to the board, I said, you know, retail is so hit or miss, we're just not gonna plan for any sales through retail. And then, you know, two weeks later, I'm like, okay, now we're rolling out in 1,600 stores at Target. And so um, it's a little bit of a learning that, like, we were still committed to it, but, you know, we honestly hadn't had a lot of traction from it. And it was the market, you know, the retailers came around to it and actually started creating entire categories around home testing. And so because of that, we then got to be the first one in the door, or we're on shelf with 23andMe, but um, it was definitely not a, not a guarantee, but something that we felt was worth the effort to continue and, to and go so after. Maybe this is a good time to talk about the $50 million round. Sure. Yeah. So, um, really big amount of money, yeah. um, especially here in Austin. Although the last six, eight, nine months have been, have been so big rounds. A lot of big a rounds. A lot of big but, rounds in you know, Austin. Uh, for the five yeah. years before that, I would say there haven't been many of those. Yeah. Um, certainly not to women CEOs. So Heather Bruner's obviously was a great big round. Yes. But um, so a lot of money to raise. So I think we want to talk a lot about sort of like how do you pull that off. Um, but I'd love to understand sort of the, th the thought process behind how and how you use $50 million. Oh, right. And was that tied to the retail rollout where you're going to have to have a lot of right. you know, it, inventory and marketing growth. So the first thing I was say was it was not because at okay. that time we didn't know that this would work. Okay, so that was before so that's this. really interesting, okay, interesting kind of development. Um, but, you know, I mentioned we had closed a Series A that we, we chose to not disclose um, last January. I'm happy to also talk about what I think about the choices around using funding for PR and the pros and cons of that. There's there was a actually lot of a panel on that earlier today okay. on this exact so There's topic. a lot yeah. of cons in my mind, especially as a founder. Um, but we chose to kind of put our head down, heads down and keep building. And ultimately, we have a really transformative strategy that we haven't yet hit, um, which is that we want to be mass market. We want tens of millions of people using Everly Well. And when you go into a drugstore, when you go on Amazon.com to buy supplements, or when you go to buy um, Tylenol, you might be getting your regular vitamin D test or your regular cholesterol test for $29 through Everly Well. And that your doctor says, hey, go pick up this this test and, and you know click the button to send me the results when you're done. And there's absolutely no reason why lab testing can't be a similar service. It also should be priced similarly to those items. And right now, you all pay the prices that are negotiated between the insurance companies and the two big players. And I saw so many similarities of this model with what Warby Parker did. And I ultimately went out and decided to raise this larger round because we needed to fulfill this vision, which was gonna take distribution dollars, marketing dollars, and a lot of supply chain and infrastructure dollars. Um, and so for us, it was essential to raise a really large growth round. We had demonstrated the unit economics. We've demonstrated the sales and the customer acquisition. And so that was not kind of in question. It was more how do we 
become this really transformative business um, and in this really dated sector, and it was going to take some money to do that. So, um, but I, I, at my Series A, had investors pushing me to take probably double the amount. On this round, we were oversubscribed, and so while it sounds like a large round, we really felt like we matched the amount we needed to raise to where we hoped to get for our objectives, and we also raised it what were, in my mind, reasonable valuations, because the exits in Austin aren't huge yet, hoping to be a different example of that, but you really have to weigh not the interim valuations that you get, but what is the next step for the company and then the step after that, um, because the interim valuation means nothing, really, um, and is merely like a point in the road, and if you go too high or too low, there's implications on either of those. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, there, it could mean a lot in that if you right. set the bar high, let's say you're at a, you know, $75 million, $100 million valuation, yeah. now you cannot sell the company for under yeah. that, Yeah. and if you want to make your investors happy and get that return, especially that. if you as a, uh, you know, founder have, you know, small common stock and they've got preferred stock, you want a really yeah. big exit. So you've, you have, even with a $50 million round, regardless of the valuation, set a high bar for what your exit's going to look Oh, yeah. Like. No, and the, and the exit is definitely large now. And that's something that we had to get comfortable with is, hey, like, do we really believe in the size of this business? And fundamentally, the answer is yes. Like, we believe that this is a multi-billion dollar revenue opportunity, not valuation opportunity. Um, and that this is also something where it's a win-win for the consumer. Um, and for the company, and so it's just this opportunity to disrupt this massively broken space. So let's talk about the how. So yeah. you had um, your seed investors, your Series A investors that you didn't disclose. Where did they come from? Like, were they on the coast? Um, how did you make those connections with them? And then how did that lead into your Series B? What was that process like for the entrepreneurs that are kind of painting their pathway for yeah. the race? Yeah, and a lot of our investors that were previously undisclosed have now become disclosed with this last announcement, so I can speak about it um, a little more specifically than prior. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, Next Coast Ventures here in town, um, which is also national, was the first uh, venture capital money that we raised. They have Next continued. Gen. Sorry. Next Gen, thank you. Next, Next Coast, Coast is also, also in, sorry, Mike's yeah. also on my board, I'll get there. <laughs> Next Gen, which is John Bassett, um, they've continued to invest and have been great partners every round, um, but really led the way in the beginning. And then Goodwater Capital um, really came in shortly after that um, through a cold email because they had flagged us on their data algorithms. And so they use a very data-driven approach, which I think reflects a lot of what we hear in the VC market around blind um, data assessments of companies rather than using pattern matching or networks. And so they reached out to me. So they didn't, they might not have known that you were actually a woman running the company. Well, I'm sure they, they the data. right. I just mean the data exactly. didn't know until they met. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so they pushed hard um, to support the company and ended up leading the Series A and the Series B. Um, and then also at the same time, Mike Smirklow, Next Coast Ventures here in Austin, has similarly made large check size investments, um, is also on our board. Um, and then Highland Capital, which is an East Coast healthcare venture, uh, large tech, but also has a lot of healthcare experience, venture firm came in. And so I really tried. And how, and how did you get connected to that? Um, that was an HBS connection. Okay. So that one was a networked connection. But none of these other people, my none of my early VCs I had any relationships with, I had any network with, um, which is very typical, I think, especially of underrepresented founders. Um, and even the physician angel that really gave us our start with a fairly large injection of capital, um, I met because my husband played golf with one of his partners. And so it's an important call out because I may never have raised that angel money if that person, didn't, my husband didn't mention to that person that I was raising money who mentioned it to a doctor that he knew who invested in diagnostics. I don't play golf. I don't meet people at bars. So like my opportunities for some of these types of connections didn't exist. And that's a lot of the structural differences that you see in fundraising of women versus men. Um, and so like, look, ultimately I, I will say like, since the company has done well, that's when you have an easy time fundraising. But it's when the company doesn't have the track record that you have to rely on your network. And I didn't have that. Yeah, but you had the you had, were delivering on the numbers. Exactly. So that was really the that thing was the that thing. Yeah, that right. converted the right investors. that converted the investors. But um, with this latest round, um, this was a round that we went out to market and kind of pressure tested in a roadshow intentionally in Q2 and Q3. We knew we weren't gonna raise until the end of the year or early this year. Um, 
and got some really good feedback, had a couple term sheets, and then ultimately uh, was pre were preempted by insiders. Um, but I was able to then support the valuation that I had set for the company, which I had done a lot of thinking around. Um, and so we brought in a couple new checks on the cap table, but ultimately it was a fairly quick process. And one of the reasons I decided to do that um, was because I knew the investors who believed in the mission. I, I have never allowed an investor onto the company board that I haven't had on the cap table for at least a year um, to try to work with that person and understand, is this really gonna be a good fit? Um, and so it was a great way to expand our investor pool while also still ensuring that we had the right dynamics um, at the company. Um, but it was a, I, I will say the last two rounds I've been fortunate have been easy, oversubscribed, and easy is a relative term. It's always a tremendous amount of work and difficult, um, but simply because the numbers are there and uh, there will be a time when they're not, and it'll be interesting to see what happens then. <laughs> so, so. Do, you, do you foresee needing to raise more capital? So we raised this round to not, to kind of have this be a round where we are default alive instead of default dead to have a, uh, I think that's a Y Combinator reference. Um, and the goal is that this does get us to profitability. Um, will we be opportunistic? Yes, if we need to be, um, to build out certain growth areas, but the, the economics are such that we will be able to reach profitability with this round. Right. So if you if it's going well with growth and you want to pour fuel on the fire, you then can. Then we have a choice, But though. you won't be have to. You and it's to. in our choice. It's yeah. our desk. It's not to say to stay alive, um, which is which is the goal. And I think that for a lot of um, high growth VC backed tech companies, you know, I always say venture capital is not necessarily the right choice for many, many, many founders. And you really have to understand the demands, the expectations, and the fund life cycle and the mindset behind venture capital. For us, it made sense. Um, but it is not something to be taken lightly because that's how you create all this friction um, with your investors and all these high pressure goals is because there are certain expectations and you have to be ready to meet those. And I have, our investors are very much on the same page. They prioritize, yes, growth, but also profitability and building a healthy and sustainable company. Um, not one that's just sort of growing and growing and growing and then has to continue raising more capital and then eventually has to flip and exit. Yeah. And which fits a little bit more of the Austin mindset. Totally. Um, yeah. And so thinking about where your investors come from and making sure you've had those conversations that you're on the same page. You know, Sarah and I have a really discreet, you know, strategy as a $20 million fund. You know, we can't put money into a big Series B or yep. Series C. And, and so we really look differently. We're looking for, you know, $100 million exits in a shorter window yep. where a lot of most exits are actually happening. That's different, you know, potentially than a company that's looking to be a unicorn. And if you have different investors with different mindsets on the same board, that's going to cause some conflict. Exactly. And then you've got the entrepreneur's personal situation if they've been in there for 10 years yeah. with a, you know, entrepreneur's salary. So those, you, you know, don't neglect the thought, you know, those things. Yeah. So um, we have a couple minutes left for questions, and I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to ask Julia things that I didn't cover, if you have any. If not, I can ask her a loaded question. Sarah. I would love to hear more about your strategy that you talked about of not um, talking publicly about your Series A clause. Sure. Um, I have a particular view on this that is a strong view, so I fully understand that this is often not, not shared by others. Um, I believe that announcing fundraises, so fundraises in and of themselves are not a mark of success. And in fact, it means that the company needs to raise capital to achieve its objectives, and the capital is a strategy of one way to do that. It also means that the founder just got diluted, um, and it also means that you tend to start to attract different kinds of talent into the company. And so for us, I saw no benefits to um, sharing the Series A because we knew it would cause other people to use that data point to compete with us and potentially throw more money at the space and the problem out of Silicon Valley than we were going to raise. I mean, somebody could easily take our press release and go to someone that they know and say, give me, give me $50 million and I can do this faster and put them out of business. Um, and the other piece was that I really, it was really important to me to keep the keep the um, talent in the company scrappy and treating the every dollar like it was their own dollar. Um, and the mindset shifts, it naturally shifts for who wants to come work at the company when they're well-funded. Um, and so we, we did decide to announce the Series B because the flip side of that is then we had the problem where companies like 23andMe, who we, you know, people, Target, 
Ancestry, Amazon, anyone who we may in the future do a partnership with, thought we were a really small company and had no idea the traction that we had or the funding that we had or that we were really serious and in the space. And so it was time where that outweighed needing to keep it confidential. Um, but I have a, it has to be a really good reason in my mind to decide to announce a fund. There's way more negatives to that um, than, you know, choosing to keep it quiet. Well, and I noticed that your company. headlines weren't only in TechCrunch, but you actually got a Wall Street Journal story you out did. of it. did. Probably because you had waited and you yes. weren't all over the place in a bunch of stories. So Wall Street Journal is going to get you the credibility exactly. with targets, et cetera, of the world. Which was a very right. specific strategy. I mean, we wanted a feature. I was on Emily Ching's um, live Bloomberg show as well, yeah, the right. day of the announcement. And those were specific strategies was, we were able to land really important um, mentions for the company that we can then build on a great PR strategy um, and a great earned media strategy because we waited on that. And so, you know, for me, if you're going to announce a fundraise, try to like make it about like use it as a strategy for something, right? Not at all yeah. just because you want to have yeah. that. And we that found title. that, you know, we've been, there have been yeah. times where as a fund, we've wanted to announce the company because- well, That makes sense too. You yeah. know, but yeah, we've yeah, had yeah. to tie it to, is this the right time for the company? So it was totally. a consumer company that was going to come out, you know, with a big launch later. And while it would have been good for our fund to have another yeah. story, because it had been quiet for a while, you know, it wasn't time to well for the company. So and they're really launched. thinking about yeah. everybody's missions and, and what is the, the, the goal of the press Absolutely. story. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we're pretty much out of time, but if I have one burning question, I'll take it before we go. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing your Thanks, everyone. with us.